We are farmers. certain designs that I've always admired, but what actually started me was, was the, um, the 67 Eldorado, 66 Riviera, and the 66 Tornado. And partly, I collected models as a kid. And of course, my, when I went away to college, my mother gave all my models away to friends' kids, so I didn't have them anymore. But one of them that I had was 53 Studebaker, which, like I say, is one of my absolute favorite designs. These are called promo size, or 124th or 125th. And I think the only reason there's a difference is it fits the same box size <laughs> from the manufacturers. When I saw the 52 Mercury as an 11-year-old kid, I said, that's it, I'm doing it. My name is David McIntosh, and I'm a retired auto designer, worked at General Motors for 35 years. I went to, uh, for my art education for design, I went to Art Center in Los Angeles. Next to the last year in high school, they gave us an assignment to find out what schools you might want to go to. So I wrote General Motors and I got four recommendations. One of them was Art Center. Go to Art Center, you open the door and there's models, there's renderings, there's you know, graphics displays, uh, all sorts of the things that they taught at the school were all on display in the front lobby there. I loved it, it was fantastic education. Really had a great time there. They hired me from there at Art Center, they interviewed us. Um, and then we had whatever, two weeks or so to come back, see my parents on the way, and come up to Detroit and get started. This was my new hometown, I knew it was coming. And then uh, I was there like roughly nine months, I think it was, um, after I started work there. I guess there weren't any openings in the studios right immediately anyway. So we had a show in the auditorium and all the designers in the building put renderings up in that. And by then my sketches were, I did some pieces that were big and the technique was good and I was ready to go. And I got resigned right after that, went to Buick was my first studio. No, I'm sorry, Advanced One was my first studio. And I worked for Ned Nichols who was the guy who put poor holes on the Buick. He, had, he was a Harley Earl guy who was the original vice president of design and he had done a show car with portholes on the hood that was timed to the cylinders, so lights would flash in the sequence of the, <laughs> the cylinders on the car. Advanced One was actually Advanced Pontiac before it became Advanced One, and Bill Mitchell didn't want the, the uh, corporate personnel and the marketing people and the people who were trying to get the next car on the road coming in and, and disrupting the creative explorations that we were doing in the Advanced Studios. So he changed the name from Advanced Pontiac to just Advanced One. And then those marketing people and so on wouldn't be coming in there on a regular basis. Uh, design, of course, was very protective of what they wanted the designs to be. So they didn't want these guys coming in here and saying, oh, I like that sketch and have it be something the boss hated. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so uh, that's how they, they would work that. Harley Earl set that up. He never wanted, he wanted to be the guy to make the choices, but he didn't want too much inter, interaction between the designers. So a lot of the identity of the cars was in the front. So he wanted those fronts distinct and you did not wander around into the other studios. You weren't really welcome. <laughs> when, we, when I was in Buick, it was just the one studio plus the interior studio. And all we did was Buicks. They were fun to work on. I liked, I, when I first went in there as a young guy, I always heard of Buicks being the doctor lawyer cars back then. And I'm thinking, God, I'm going to do this. But it was fun because we had a lot of leeway. Harley Earl was very specific about keeping the brand separate and making identity as they went through the years. That, that continued on through. And in fact, toward the end of my career, when Wayne Cherry was vice president, they were told to really focus in on the brands because by the 90s, you know, especially by the 90s, uh, with all the foreign cars coming in, identities were starting, you know, the, some of the early foreign cars that came over were actually copies of either European cars or American cars, and so the brands could get 
kind of blurred, but the brand identities were very important, and, and Buick had its own set of things that kind of said Buick to people. Well, you, usually you get some sort of definition of a program, and pretty much just see what you could do from there. And it's, each one of those categories sets up a different way that you would approach your sketching, and then you just doodle thoughts that come to your mind, things that you might have been interested in before, or just something that just pops in your head, and play with that. I've talked about where creative, creative ideas come from somewhere. It's kind of hard to say. I mean, it's you're either just kind of in that mode yourself. Most cars have some kind of history, so you have some sense of where you're going with that. But then your loose sketches will then you will tighten them up if you think you've done one that you really like or that you think your boss might be really interested in. Or if they even come by into your desk like the studio chief might see a, a, just a pencil sketch and say, well, yeah, that looks good, work on that. You might go from there. And, uh, and then from there you do a nice rendering if they like it from there, like in a, having a review on a board of sketches. And they might pick one and you do a full size drawing of it from there and you get a package from the engineering people that tells you the basic layout of the car, the wheelbase, where the engine is, where the people are sitting, that sort of thing, where the windshield should be and then you can build something around that based on your sketch. It's just a new challenge basically. Um, one boss told us, in fact I think it was probably Jordan, he says, he says don't fall in love with your work because that's why because you might just get totally smashed down. You think you've done the greatest thing on earth and it's not. <laughs> the boss isn't looking for that. So you have to, you just go on to the next challenge and you just start over and you say, well, okay, if he didn't say what he didn't like, well, I'll try this. And then you just start and you, you go from there. Well, it, we were all working on the Firebird project. And of course we were completely Firebird insane by this time. All of us just loved the Firebirds. And this was the current model, 77. And for some reason, we all wound up buying cars that year. We all bought black ones, and everybody thought that was so fun that we uh, got a chance to take a photograph. We called the photographic people and went out on what's called the ride road. And this is Ilya Rusnov on, on the end here. It's me, and this is Roger Hewitt, who was our studio assistant and also did the theme for the 82 Firebird. And this is John Caffaro, who's done quite well in the company, and been involved in a lot of different cars. He was a brand new kid at the time, new kid on the block. And we all had these Trans Ans. 400 horse, 400 cubic inch engine. I could watch the gas gauge go down on that car. I actually wound up being stranded and had to walk and get some gas one time with that car. But I loved it anyway, it was a great car. For me, at least, it's mostly from an art point of view. It's the aesthetics, it's the shapes. Uh, and I like working with car shapes because of the, the idea of speed motion, flowing through the air, all that stuff. I, I like all of that. Yeah, this is the patent for the checkerboard wheel. You don't get anything for it. I mean, you get 50 cents, I think they give you a silver dollar or whatever it is. <laughs> wheels just were a thing for me. I love, I really like designing wheels. I, w I was doing that like the Camaro sketches and um, the idea was they always had the checkered flag like from racing and so I just based it on the, f the five bolts radiating out like a checkered flag. So it's an alternate of front surface and air outlets, just based on the checkered flag. When this one, uh, our, our ex uh, executive boss that was overseeing all the advanced studios was Dave Holtz. And he came in one day and saw the setup with these wheels out in the front in our lobby of our advanced one studio. Said, uh, I want that wheel took it up to, uh, to Chevrolet and they used it for the Monte Carlo. And when I was working for Porter, if, if he saw something he liked, he'd have you just do a 3D model of it. He, that's that part of that Pratt training. To, if you were doing a 3D object, let's do it in 3D, then just draw it. And we happened to have as our chief uh, modeler in our studio was a man named Dave, Davis Rossi. Fantastic modeler. He could make your designs look better than you could. It's a three-wheeler. So I was theorizing too that the three-wheeler would be better if the two wheels were in the front, not in the back. So it's two in the front, one in the back, and use a front drive engine. Yeah, I, I did this so I could explain this because um, 
obviously there was no program or any engineering around for this, so I just did it. And this shows like the side view. This is compared to a Chevette. Anybody remember a Chevette? <laughs> so this is the front drive unit, and obviously an engineer gave me that silhouette to use. And then we use, this is very typical of package drawings, actually, something like this. And then this is a half view of the upper, looking on the plan view of the car. Package meaning it has, shows the engine, the, the, this, the wheelbase, the, the seating areas, that sort of thing. I was just, I was doing a shape study and working with the large glass. I actually did some um, other uh, cars with large glass. We had, I had a car where the glass was quite a bit of the whole side of the car. Big companies like GM, they want to make money on their cars, so <laughs> this would probably be a very limited market, something like this, but uh, I just thought, well, it shows a possibility. Yeah, and that's what the advanced studios are for, is to, to show things like this. They don't always work, and sometimes the bosses will come and say, what in the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and then you get back onto what is a real program or something like that. But, but that's why you have advanced areas, and I think they, they actually did a lot for us. Uh, some of the most beautiful 60s cars that are collector cars today, they were done in, a lot of them were done in advanced studios. I waited, uh, I, I, the reason I have a lot of my stuff here uh, that I did this in my later years, I didn't know this as a kid when I first started there, but you could, um, I just kept these, th we always had file cabinets and you keep your work, you can keep your work in drawers and stuff instead of throwing it away. But knowing every once in a while they'll come through and say, oh, the studio's a mess, get rid of all this stuff. And they would throw all that stuff out, clean out the drawers, get rid of stuff. Well, I thought, I will never be known as anything or have anything in my career to even prove I was ever here if I don't keep some of this stuff. And I found out I could get a pass from my executive designer. And when the programs were done, not, not like do it now, show it to the boss, take it home. No, not like that. I would keep, sometimes these things would be in my drawers for months. And eventually I would hit one of those cleanup periods and I would get a, pack them in a um, brown paper thing and say personal artwork, this is what they told me to do, and get a pass and the guards would let you out with it. <laughs>